Hello YouTube, welcome to episode 2 of the Legends of the Past series. I've decided to make this a staple on the channel because I've realized that we need more role models and we need more positive influence in general and that is to be found in the days of old because there is a lot of natural bodybuilders that we can look at and learn a lot from but sadly they're not really around us anymore and so for us to be able to actually bring back a new generation of great natural lifters, we need to be able to look back at the people that in the past were doing things properly, to recall the wisdom of the ancients, if you will. So, after talking about Jacques Lalanne in the first episode you can find in the description, today we're going to be talking about Steve Reeves. Steve Reeves who is a favorite for a lot of people. For a lot of people, he constitutes the perfect natural bodybuilder in both physique, but also in mindset, and you're going to see exactly why. So as for Steve himself, he was born in the US in 1926, and he moved to California when he was 10, because sadly, his father passed away when he was very young. Before he was even a year old, his father had already died, and he died in an horrific accident in a farm involving machinery, it wasn't a pretty sight. It was something pretty traumatic. Thankfully, he wasn't already cognizant or aware at such a young age, but he had to grow up without a dad. And that is already a big problem as a young man because you grow up without a role model and many of us can relate, be it because, again, we didn't have a dad ourselves or because the role models in this fitness industry are not the greatest. He started actually developing his physique at a very early age because his mom, even though she went through a lot of trouble and a lot of, again, traumas, was looking at her, her son and thinking, hmm, I don't like his posture because his posture was really poor. It was constantly slouched. And therefore, she was thinking he was going to develop into a poor specimen of men. So what she decided to do is she put a brace on him and the brace would actually poke him in the ribs every time he would slouch so that it would force him to stay upright. And just like that, he developed perfect posture. Now, I don't know what you think of this. Nowadays, this would be called abuse because in a sense, she did put a device of torture on her son, but it worked perfectly. And I sort of have to give her props and credit because even in the midst of a very difficult time where she had just lost her husband and she was a single mom, she still found it in her to look at her son and think, okay, he's developing into something that is not optimal for men, so I need to fix him up right now. And I think that this explains why he was always able in the, to the future and the days that followed when he aged to apply the same mindset to himself because he was always in the pursuit of perfection. And that is something that characterizes Steve Reeves. Many people see him as sort of the perfect man. But as we can tell here, he didn't start perfect. And it continued because at school, he wasn't the strongest nor the biggest. And he got beaten up regularly. And one day he actually lost an arm wrestling tournament and match to a much smaller boy. And that left a very bad taste in his mouth. And upon learning that the boy actually lifted weights, he decided he wanted to do it himself. Now, it's funny because I can relate to that personally. For me, the realization I had to start working on myself was when I lost to armrest to a girl in an arm wrestling competition. So, in a sense, Steve Reeves is less pathetic than I am because I lost to like a tiny Chinese girl. He lost to an actual boy, so he had an excuse. But it, it gave him the same feeling of, of discontentment and he wanted to fix himself. So what he did is he started lifting. He started lifting because he was weak, just like many of us do, okay? It's something we can all relate to. And he actually developed fairly quickly. You can find pictures of him when he was 14, 16. His physique was growing. Now, of course, it's not on the level of fake nannies nowadays, but to any 16-year-old, it is a tremendous physique. He was very developed. And you can see, especially in the lats and core area, that he was very wide and he had very good mass already there. The rest of his body was very skinny. He had skinny arms, skinny shoulders and legs. But that's sort of normal when you're a teen. These areas tend to fill up later on in life. But his journey with fitness started at that point. It started pretty much in middle school 
with a previous experience with posture and self-improvement forced upon him by his mom. That sadly had to stop at some point because he was drafted to go fight in World War II. But before that, he was spotted by a personal trainer at his high school that could see the potential in Steve. Sadly, that potential would have to wait to be actualized because he had to fight for his country first. And in World War II, he was a distinguished soldier, actually. If you buy his book, he talks about stories about the war in details. I'm not going to tell you all of them. I'm going to just laser focus on the ones I find the most interesting. And for me, what, what really I found remarkable in this is that he was at war. He wasn't at a gold's gym with a protein shake and rice available. He had to eat military rations, he couldn't really lift weights, and he had to kill other people to save his own bacon, so it wasn't the best environment for muscle building. And on top of that, he contracted malaria, not two times, not three times, but four times in a row, which led to him losing 30 pounds, which is terrible, but at the same time, you're thinking, man, he survived that? Third, he, he had four bouts of jungle fever, and he didn't die from that. That is impressive. So he lost all of that weight, and of course, it felt terrible, because when you're a lifter and you build all of that muscle mass, and it, you just then shit it out, it is, in a sense, like your life's work being dissipated in front of you. But he managed to make, uh, make up for it by sneaking a 210 pounds barbell underneath his bed in the barracks. Now, I don't know how that works, how you can put the barbell on the plates. He must have had like a weird... A uh, weird way to go about it in terms of geometry, but you would expect the barbell to stick from underneath the bed. He managed. He managed to have that available for him, and he would lift every single day in secret. And he built up his physique tremendously just with that available, with the shitty nutrition on top of that, to the point that the other soldiers started to call him the shape. Even his superiors took notice and they were so impressed that they asked him to train the rest of the guys so that they could actually be stronger and more physically fit, which connects with Jacques Lalanne, who was also training soldiers to be more fit. This correlates to a trait about Steve Reeves that everyone who met him said he possessed in droves, and that is charisma. Apparently, the guy was incredibly charismatic he had a very animalistic trait to him. He was very magnetic. And so people just wanted to follow him. He was a natural born leader. But that was mostly due to the fact that he struggled throughout his life. He had to fight for his spot in the wood. And so he had a strong energy and a strong machismo about him. And that led him to becoming the icon that we know today. That's the reason why so many people still hold him in very high regards. In terms of stats, for the people who don't know, um, I'm going to tell you exactly the numbers, but I would expect you to go check out his physique because numbers don't mean much if they lead to a shitty physique. He was the exact opposite. The numbers, if you just look at them on paper with our eyes, the modern eyes of people who are completely deluded by pro bodybuilding, don't look that much. But when you look, his, look, when you look at his body, you, can, you see, you can tell that he was special. His physique was extraordinary. So he was six feet one, between 210 and 225. He had 19 inches arms, some say 18.5. He had a 52 inches chest, 29 inches waist, 26, 26 inches thighs, 18.5 inches calves. So that's his broad measurements. Now, I don't fully believe in some of them, but I think that they're close to reality. And the reason why I say that is because he did, in fact, have a tremendous physique. As for his body fat percentage, it's tough to estimate. He certainly wasn't below 10%. I would say he was around 10%. He wasn't super lean or shredded. He just had a lot of muscle, meaning that you could see lean muscular mass on his frame, the way it should be. And he was known to say that when your arms are bigger than your head, something is wrong, which is interesting because this means that he believed in the Greek proportions. The Greek proportions state that you have to have a ratio to your physique. Your head needs to be in relation to the bicep, the bicep to the calf, the waist to the shoulders, etc. Everything is looked at as if you are going to make a statue. 
And that led to him looking like a statue because it's something he imposed on himself. He forced his body to follow these Greek proportions to the point he would downsize muscles on purpose. He did that with his calves. He had big calves and his arms were too small. So he refused to train calves until his arms caught up. And that led to them being the same size. And he was a big proponent of that. Likewise, he believed that the arm should be the same size as the neck. That is an interesting vision that was his vision. And a lot of people abide by it because they think that his physique is the best of all times. And that led him, that very mindset, to being Mr. Universe and Mr. America several times. So he might have a point, right? The Greeks followed the Greek ideals and aesthetics based off of numbers and math for a reason. is because they believed they had found true perfection for the human form. I disagree with that in terms of personal aesthetics, but objectively, it is something you can argue. But it didn't really serve him that much because apparently he was so muscular that him just being around people made some men uncomfortable, meaning that you would expect people to be impressed, but some just couldn't believe he was real. And that led to things that are barely believable. Like, for example, that he would cause car accidents by his mere presence. And that if he walked along the beach, he would draw a crowd. So people would start to follow him thinking, wow, that's a demigod. Like that's something that's not from Earth. He must have just dropped from the stratosphere and a different planet because he's clearly not human. That is the level of muscular development that Steve Reeves had compared to his contemporaries, of course. And that led to him just completely crushing the competition when he started doing bodybuilding because he was pinned against guys that were, yes, muscular, but not as much as him. Coming from a kid who was very skinny with shit posture, that is extremely inspiring, especially when you, again, remember that he went through war. He actually fought in the war, lost 30 pounds, still made it back, and still made it bigger and better than the rest of all bodybuilders. And to him, this was due to his beliefs in the power of visualization and his positive imagery. He was always thinking about his future and what he was going to do and what he was going to conquer. And he always believed that he was going to be victorious and he always was. And I also believe in that. For the visualization aspect, he would picture his physique in his head and think, I want to look like this. And he would then work on it and it would actually appear in real life. That is a deeply spiritual approach to bodybuilding that nowadays has been a little bit diffused, but that was very present in Steve Reeves. He was quoted to say, when I walked out, I would concentrate deeply on the exercise I was doing and the muscle I was working. I would picture the strands of muscle walking and getting bigger. I would put myself into almost a hypnotic trance when I was working out. For a lot of people, when we train, when you train, sometimes we, go through, we just go through the motions because we're tired, we're not focused, we just do it. It's good because at least we do something, but we might be missing something. There might be a piece of the puzzle missing, and that is the spiritual. We're not really in the instant, we're not really into the muscle, and that might be a game changer for every single session that you don't apply it to. Steve Reeves did that every single time. He trained, and he would train three times a week, full body style, for the people who know, and he gave himself plenty of rest. He believed that rest was important, but to him it was important because his sessions were absolutely trashing. He would destroy his body. He would do actual full body splits, meaning that it's not just that he would do one or two exercises for each body part. He would crush every single muscle, and he would leave the legs for until the end of the session because to him, he believed that if you train the legs first, you, get, you are now too tired for the rest of the exercises, and he might have a point, at least for full body splits, because for full body, if you open with squats and deadlifts, for example, which I don't advise you do, you don't have really much energy left for presses afterwards. So he would always open with the presses, knowing he could then crush the legs afterwards. So a typical Steve Reeves split was shoulders and chest first, then lats and biceps, then triceps with the biceps, quads, arm strings, calves, lower back, abs, and neck. So he had a synergistic approach to training and an antagonistic as well. And as you can notice, he trained the abs and the neck. He didn't uh, actually just ignore them. He isolated them 
seriously the way every bodybuilder should. And he also understood the importance of supersets because he would train opposite muscles, antagonistic muscles, in supersets to save time and to also, again, put in more work every single time he would train to make the best and the most out of those three sessions. He also always had a goal and he never settled for less than what he expected, fighting for extra rep and progress every single time. He was known for loving slow negatives and he never limited himself. Actually, when he came back from the war, a very fair, uh, famous story that people told is that he came back and he started making insane progress right off the bat because he wasn't limited in his mindset. He didn't think, okay, I'm back, so I'm just going to gain that much muscle. No, he did everything he could without overworking, resting plenty, and he exploded in size. People couldn't believe their eyes in front of the, the muscle monster he was becoming in the span of a few weeks. Keep in mind, of course, that's a lot of muscle memory, but still very impressive. And as for cardio, he loved pole walking and he was a big advocate of that as well. He would go on walks every single day, four times a week, if possible, with a very brisk pace and long distances. And I believe that this is a very good way to stay healthy also overall. Talking about health, uh, Steve Reeves and his approach to nutrition was mainly based on whole foods, which any good natural bodybuilder, any natural athlete in reality who is going to give you advice about nutrition should focus on whole foods because it's the healthiest way to eat. But for him, he did something different than most natural bodybuilders at the time who focused intently on proteins. He was more of a carbs guy where he thought that carbs were very important and he had a 60-20-20 split, so 60% carbs. And it's something I do as well. He was shocking people around him because, again, most bodybuilders were all about steak and he was eating oats, rice, porridge, all of that stuff because he thought and he felt that carbs worked best for him. And I am the same. It depends on the individual. Some people are going to do better off of fats and protein. Some people like carbs better. You have to experiment. And he did because he wasn't afraid to go against the status quo. He always tried new stuff. And he also started carb loading before it was a trend invented by pro bodybuilding. But he did that for performance, meaning that he would eat most of his carbs the day before he would train so that he would be full of glycogen and his muscles were really endurant and ready to put in the work. It's something also I do as well. You can give it a try. And a quote, and I think it's my favorite quote from Steve Reeves, that he was known to tell people who had the wrong approach to training is, no pain, no gain. No, no brain, no gain. Meaning that to him, suffering was less important, but if suffering becomes your main goal and your main approach to muscle building, you're going to suffer for nothing because you're not going to get results. The brain is what is important. He was constantly thinking about his training and nutrition to refine it because he believed that intelligence was an important part of being a bodybuilder. And that is also what made him so popular and so famous in a sense is that he wasn't just a meathead. He wasn't just a guy with a good physique. He was respected because he was also able to inspire people and direct them and guide them with intelligence. And that has led people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, and a lot of the top bodybuilders of the time to see him as their idol and icon. And to this day, people still do that. Many people, if you ask them, who's your favorite bodybuilder, old school bodybuilder, the name you will hear is Steve Reeves. And it's interesting to see that those people, I'm talking about the bodybuilders, had such a respect for him because they went directly against what he preached. Keep in mind, Steve Reeves was the guy who was quoted to say, I don't believe in bodybuilders using steroids. If a man doesn't have enough male hormones in his system to create a nice, hard, muscular body, he should take up ping pong. That is the most based anti-story message I've ever heard in my life. And it cracks me up that people like Lee Priest, for example, would then repeat that same quote without realizing that it was calling him out for being a little bitch, in a sense, because he was on drugs. And all of these guys also were on drugs, which is something that, again, Reeves was directly opposed to. To him, taking drugs was being a pussy. It was being less of a man because you didn't even trust in your own body enough to let it do its thing 
and make you burn muscle off of your natural production, you had to resort to steroids. To him, it wasn't normal. And he even went as far as to say that he didn't believe in that for bodybuilders. So he was basically saying that people who bodybuilded with steroids were not really bodybuilders. And I agree with that 100%. They should be called something else. Natural bodybuilders are the real bodybuilders. And that also is, is something that at his age and at the time when he was very popular made him into an icon, as I said, but also someone that wasn't really able to profit off of it because there wasn't much money in bodybuilding at the time because it was still natural bodybuilding, it was still pure, so it wasn't perverted by money yet, which is something I wish it stayed, but the thing for him is that he wasn't able to really make a living off of it, so he had to become an actor, he had to actually find a way to make money off of his physique. But the problem is that he was so big and muscular as an actor that most directors didn't want to use him because they were like, well, I don't have a role for you. You're too big. Like, you're too massive. And he was asked several times repeatedly to lose weight for his roles, sometimes upwards of 20 pounds of lean mass so that he would look more average, which if you are so big that you're asked to shrink down to look normal, that is the best compliment that one can make. But Reeves always refused because he was seeking perfection and he was always saying that we should try not only to build a balanced life, but also a balanced physique. To him, the two went hand in hand. If you are not training on your physique, you aren't really living life because living life is also building a balanced physique. And that is a message that more people need to hear nowadays because most normies, most people who don't uh, participate in YouTube fitness or the lifting sphere in general, completely ignore their body, their life is in balance, and they live a bad life. Because building your body is building your life. It's one and the same. But because the industry made no use of his muscles, he had to find different roles. So he was asked to do a number of other roles that had close to no relation with the way he looked. Like, for example... He was at some point a janitor. He was a gym employee, like a gym owner. He also was casted in a lot of roles where he was presented as an alpha male. So funnily, at some point, he was casted as a guy who cocks someone else, where he's presented as that big muscular guy. And the girlfriend of the main character is sort of, she's like hugging him and thinking, oh, he's such, a, he's such a wonderful statue of a man, such a beautiful Greek god, and the boyfriend on the side is seething. He was already used as like the example of what women desired back in the days. But these were not roles that really required him to use his muscles or his charisma in any fashion. He said repeatedly that during that time, he was only asked to take his suit off once, which is funny because if you look at these Hollywood actors nowadays, they're always shirtless on steroids and shirtless because that's all they have to offer. He was more than just that because he was actually a very talented actor. But at some point, thankfully, Hollywood started casting him for the roles he was made for. And those roles were always the ones related to war, to warriors, to legends of the past, because he was, in a sense, a gladiator, but in the modern world, in the modern environment. He embodied what most people would think people like Hercules or Jason would look like, heroes of Greek mythology that he represented and that he still represents in a sense. Also, he loved horses. So that works beautifully for all of these roles where he had to be on horse back. All of these epic movies that most people know him from because that's when he became really a global phenomenon when he started playing in movies. He played in Hercules, in Goliath, and a plethora of gladiator movies because he was the archetype of the warrior. If you think of what warriors looked like, I don't think they looked like pro bodybuilders, right? Because all of that mass and size is completely useless. I would even go as far as to say that they didn't look like I look because I'm even a little bit too bulky for some of these activities like throwing a spear and like wielding a sword and blocking with a shield. Reeves had that, meaning that he wasn't small, I'm not going to say he was small, but he had an athletic looking physique where you could totally see the guy in a battle like 2000 years ago fighting against the Persians. It's something that you could have envisioned 
because he looked the part and so he could play all of these roles beautifully. But sadly for him, he eventually destroyed his shoulder when his chariot slammed into a tree. So the guy was doing his own stunts to the point that he was even doing the very dangerous ones because he dislocated a shoulder when an essential, like a, an old school car in a sense, slammed into a tree at full blast. He survived that with only a dislocated shoulder that he then re-dislocated because he kept filming. Like most actors nowadays, they, I don't know, they snap a nail or whatever. They're home, they're going to cry over their boo-boo for five years. He was on the set like 15 seconds afterwards. And I can just see him like resetting his shoulder hastily and then just going back and saying, okay, next scene. Well, next scene, he was supposed to swim for a, a, a session where he was supposed to escape from a pre, uh, I think it was uh, like a, a building that was falling apart, if I remember correctly. And he re-dislocated his shoulder, but he kept filming. He kept filming until the end of that actual shot. The problem is that he smoked his shoulder in the process. So that didn't really work in his favor. But it still to me shows that he, he had massive balls, maybe to his detriment. He was also supposed to play James Bond in 62 that he refused meaning that we could have had Steve Reeves as James Bond could have been pretty cool. But he stopped entirely because his style of films were going out of popularity. Sadly, all of these peplums, all of these gladiator movies were slowly replaced by other wimpier, less interesting movies, which is a shame. I wish all of these would make a comeback. All of the medieval style movies were excellent because they showcased very good role models for young boys, and he was one of them. That's for his life, that's for his career and what he did. In terms of personal life, he had two wives that he survived and he eventually died at the age of 74. Now, 74 is a bit young for someone who was so healthy, but he didn't die from old age or disease. He died from a blood clot from a botched surgery, sadly for him. And so that is when he passed away and that concluded his life. But it certainly wasn't the end of Steve Reeves because he still lived through his filmography and especially his existence and presence as a natural bodybuilder. Because, as I said, he was always someone that people looked up to. And even after death, he was such a great role model. He had such charisma that it transcended the realm of the death and life. And to this day, we still talk about him just like I did right now because... These natural bodybuilders of the past had something special because they had something we could relate to. We can all relate to being skinny. We can all relate to having poor posture, losing to a kid that's smaller, feeling that frustration, growing your body slowly. All of these are experiences that every single male goes through. That is the true essence of a, of a male power fantasy. It's someone that is going to achieve something you want but that didn't start from a place so unrealistic that you can't connect with them. Nowadays, I, think, I find personally most pro bodybuilders and influencers to be too fake. They try to be too perfect and therefore they're boring. Steve Reeves was a man and because he was a man, he was able to become a god. And I'm going to, let, uh, to leave you with a quote from him, a quote that encapsulates his mindset and philosophy in life. To be in shape and to be fit is a good thing, but I don't think it should dominate and lead your life. It's just one of the aspects of your life. Can you really picture someone who apparently is all about bodybuilding saying something like this? No, it's not possible. Why? Because many people nowadays are too one-dimensional. He wasn't like that. He had many hobbies, many passions, many interests. And he wanted people to know that the pursuit of a good physique is not something incredible that needs to consume you and becomes your entire being. It's something that everyone should be doing and that should take space in your life, but not so much that it becomes the only thing you do. Because lifting is supposed to enhance the rest of your life, not completely replace it. And I'm going to leave you with that. You will be able to see more of these episodes very soon. I'm going to try and produce one per month. I already have five or six listed, but if you have certain ideas or certain suggestions, please let me know in the comments and I will see you next time.